Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Back in 2009, a journalist by the name of uh, Jeffrey Gettleman wrote an article called The Most Dangerous Place in the World, and it was an article about Mogadishu, Somalia. You might remember Mogadishu from the Black Hawk Down incident in 1993. Uh, it's a dangerous place. Generally, the city has been very chaotic uh, for decades, and that chaos at, at, at points has spilled out into the surrounding country. And it's created scenes like the one that Gettleman recounts in his article. He remembers standing in the doorway of a hut in famine-stricken central Somalia, watching as this one young woman was laying in the hut and was taking her last shallow breaths. He was told by a village elder that she hadn't eaten for days, and in reflecting on this scene, he wrote these words. He said, the world is like me, standing in the doorway, looking in at two decades of anarchy, unsure what to do. It's a haunting scene. It's a haunting thing that he witnessed. You know, scenes like these are what the Apostle Paul has in mind, I think, when he writes our epistle reading for today from Romans chapter 8. It's what he means when he says things and uses words like suffering and corruption and groaning. Paul's looking at the problem of evil in Romans chapter 8. And basically, when you look at the problem of evil from a biblical standpoint, there are two parts to it. One part is that people do wrong. They do things they shouldn't. People are corrupt. People hurt others. People use the people around them or the people below them for their own gain. People exploit other people. They exploit creation. In other words, to put it very simply and in theological terms, people sin. It's what we do. It's our sinful nature. And that's part of the problem of evil. But there's another part too. The second part is that people suffer. People like that young Somali woman in the hut. In the hut. People like all the names that we're going to read on our prayer list in a few minutes. People who live in poverty, not just across the world, but very often just across the street. Or even this morning, just across the sanctuary. People suffer. And you know, sometimes in our lives we're able to forget that for a little while until we come across it face to face in the doorway of a hut or on the street corner in the city or in a conversation with our friends or even in our very own lives. People do wrong and people suffer. That's the problem of evil. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 8, or at least it's what's in the background. Because see, in Romans 8, he gives us something. He gives us something to help us in the face of the problem of evil. He doesn't, and God doesn't, frankly, always give us what we want by any means. So usually when we talk about the problem of evil, when we think about it, whether it's theoretically or, or we think about it practically because it's happening in our lives, when we think about the problem of evil and we're face to face with suffering, we tend to think about the question, why? That's what we tend to ask. Why does God let this happen? Why would a good God allow such suffering? We want answers to, the, to that, that question. Why does God do this? But that's not the question I'm going to tackle today. Really for kind of two reasons. Uh, one, because Scripture doesn't answer that question. It's, it's, it's silent on the question of why. And two, because as a result, Paul is silent on the question of why in Romans chapter 8. And he goes another direction. And honestly, I think it's a really important one. And even a more important one. Paul talks about what God is doing about the problem of evil. See, as Lutherans, we don't believe that God is uninvolved in the world today. You know, we don't look around at the world and go, well, Jesus ascended into heaven, so I guess we're on our own until he gets back. That's not what we do. We don't, we don't see God as watching from far away. We see him as directly and intimately involved in what goes on in our world right now. Colossians 1 says exactly that. It's talking about creation. It's talking about Jesus. And it says, in him all things hold together. God is not just standing in the doorway, looking in and watching us suffer and wondering what to do. And if you believe that, if you see God as involved in our world, 
then the other question is, what is God doing about it? And that's a question that Scripture does answer. In fact, it has an awful lot to say about it. So I want to look at three points that Scripture makes this morning on, on God's solution to the problem of evil. We'll look at the temporal solution of justice, the temporal solution of mercy, and the eternal solution of the right-hand kingdom. So justice, mercy, kingdom of God. That's where we're headed this morning. Justice first. Temporal solution of justice. There's really no question that this is a good thing, that justice is a good thing. I mean, you don't have to to be a Christian in the face of injustice to want to see justice. You don't have to be a Christian to want justice when you see evil. This is the first part of the temporal solution. And and, and it it solves the problem or it it works toward a solution to the problem of when people do wrong. Very common to call for justice when somebody's been wrong. If you drive through towns in southern Illinois, sometimes you'll see yard signs out that say, justice for so-and-so. And And -and so-and-so is usually the victim of a crime. You don't have to watch too many crime shows to find out that when when somebody is convicted and sentenced and justice is done, it's a great relief for victims and for families. It's so great a value that we have that we even name our superheroes after it, right? All the best superheroes get together, or at least if you're a DC fan, all the best superheroes get together, and what do we call it? The Justice League, exactly, because what else would the best people do other than fight for justice? It's an important value for us, and it's an important value for us because it's an important value for God. It's important to us because God has planted it in our hearts. It's what we call the natural knowledge of God. It's corrupted by sin. We sometimes have a very messed up sense of what justice is, but it's there. So what does God do about the problem of evil? He plants justice in our hearts, and he actually plants something else there too. He's planted a sense of vocation. If you remember last week, Pastor Brandon talked about that. He talked about identity and he talked about vocation. Vocation is the stuff that we do with our lives, what we should do with our lives, our callings. And along with vocation, he's planted in our hearts a sense of order, a sense that we as human beings should organize ourselves. And God uses this in the world today. These are Paul's words from Romans 13. It's verse 4. He's talking about governing authorities. And here's what he says. If you would do wrong, be afraid. For he, the governing authority, does not bear the sword in vain. And listen to this part. For he is the servant of God, an avenger, Marvel fans, there you go, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. A servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath. We like to complain about the government. I mean, it's a very American thing to do, right? It's apple pie, baseball, and complaining about the government. Those are the three big ones, I think, for us. And there's good reason to do that. There's very often good reason to do that. Governing authorities are not above sin. They're not above the wrongdoing that we see everywhere else in the world. That's true. But imperfect and broken though they are, they're also servants of God. They're also instruments of justice. They're also the means by which God rights wrongs in the here and now. God is not just standing in the doorway, looking in at wrongdoing and wondering what to do. He's doing it. That's why we have things like presidents and governors and representatives and kings and police and soldiers and stuff like that. They are tools in the hands of the one who orders the world. They're a part of God's temporal solution to the problem of evil. But they're only part. That's important too. They're only part. Justice is important when people do wrong. But remember, there's two parts to the problem of evil. There's wrongdoing and there's suffering. I've been in an awful lot of hospital rooms this week and last week, I'll be honest. It's, there's been a lot of people in the hospital, and as a pastor, you find yourself in the hospital room quite a bit. Uh, I myself have stood in doorways wondering what to do pretty often. What I normally do at those visits is I go in and I read scripture with people and I pray with them while they're there, and especially on pre-surgery visits, something interesting usually happens. There'll be a lot of medical people around getting somebody ready for surgery, and they react very differently when I pull out my book and I get ready to pray with the family. Sometimes they'll ask to be a part of it. Sometimes they'll stay in the room and pray with us. 
Other times, they'll, they'll step outside the room. And some of them, I'm sure, do it out of a sense of, of wanting to give us privacy. Others probably do it because they don't share the same faith. It's very interesting to watch this. But we're all gathered there around something that Christians and non-Christians can all agree on. Mercy. See, there's an innate human desire to alleviate suffering when we run across it. And again, it's there because the Creator put us there. It put it there. Put it in us. Planted it in our hearts. We call it the natural knowledge of God. And as Christians, we know also that Jesus calls us to do mercy all the time to all people everywhere. Remember the Good Samaritan parable? Everybody's your neighbor. Everybody's the people that we do mercy to. There's a little neighborhood in Kolkata, India, and and it's a place called Kaligat, and it's a neighborhood that surrounds a Hindu Hindu temple, Uh, and, and it's a very unique Hindu temple because there's this division in the building. So on one side of the division, you got a Hindu temple just like any Hindu temple you'd find anywhere in India. But on the other side of the building, on the other side of the division, on the other side of the building is the Missionaries of Charity Hospice Center. It's the center that Mother Teresa set up so that people, the lowest of the low, would have a safe and a warm place to die. The Hindu temple gave them that part of the building because they saw the good that was being done and the mercy that the missionaries of charity, that Mother Teresa and her sisters were living out. I was there for two weeks on a social work practicum once, and I remember lots of people who came in, but one person in particular has always stood out to me. It was somebody that they found in the train station. They found a lot of people there. He'd been laying there so long that he was, his whole back was covered with bed sores, and I remember the night he died. I remember being there surrounding his bed, with a whole bunch of other people who were there too, some of them Christians, some of them just medical workers and not Christians, being there for his last hours on earth as he took his last breath. And we were there gathered so that he would be safe and so that he would be warm and so that he would not be alone. Mercy is something that is dear to our hearts because the Creator put it, put it there. And the kind of mercy that alleviates worldly suffering is something that just about all people can agree on because it's an idea that's planted deep in our hearts when the Creator put it there. It's the natural knowledge of God. And you don't have to be in Calcutta to do it. You don't have to be overseas to do it. We do it here all the time. Sometimes we are far away. We did it in our Honduras mission trips and our New Orleans mission trips. We did it when we went across the river and built the tiny homes for veterans. That was God using us for his mercy. You do it when you donate to the special needs fund here. And we use it as a congregation so people can keep their homes and keep their water on and keep their lights on. That's God using us for mercy. This is all stuff that you can do and some of it you can do without even leaving your home. Now up to this point, I think it'd be really easy for us to kind of look at all this stuff and go, yeah, pastor, but that's really all people doing it, right? And certainly that's how unbelievers look at the world. That's true. But Luther says it this way. This is his comments from Psalm 147. He says, God could easily give you grain and fruit without your plowing and without your planting. But he doesn't want to do it that way. What else is all our good work to God, whether in the fields or the garden or the city or the house or in war or in government, but like a child's performance by which he wants to give us his gifts in the field, at home, and everywhere else? And listen to this part. These are the masks of God behind which he wants to remain concealed and do all things. The left-hand kingdom stuff, the stuff that we've been talking about, God's temporal solutions, they are masks of God. The vocations that we live out in our lives are masks of God. They are the means by which God meets his, our earthly and our bodily needs. God is not waiting in the doorway, looking in on our suffering and wondering what to do. He's doing it. He's doing it all the time. And these are all good things, but so far... So far, these are all temporal solutions. So far, these are all solutions for the here and now. They don't address the real problem. 
They don't address the sin that leads to injustice and that leads to suffering because they're all part of what we call the left-hand kingdom stuff. The governing authorities, the structures in our society, the principles and the vocation that God plants in our world that fight the problem of evil, they're good things, but they don't solve the problem of evil. Not completely, not ultimately, and not eternally. For that solution, you've got to have the right-hand kingdom. For that solution, you've got to have the church. And for that solution, you've got to have the king of kings that stands behind and works through the church. See, God's eternal solution to the problem of evil is always the cross. It is always the empty tomb. And in that, we can see the ultimate act of God's justice and God's mercy all at the same time. God's justice we see in the horrors of the cross, the wrath of God that is poured out on all the injustice and all the suffering provoked by sin in the world. The wrath of God on sin poured out on the cross. But at the same time, we see God's ultimate act of mercy because it's not me hanging there. And it's not you hanging there. It's Jesus hanging there. Paul talks about corruption and suffering and groaning in Romans 8, but he also talks about eagerness and longing. And one of my favorite words, hope. And hope is something that is unique to the church. It's something that only the gospel can bring. See, without it, Life is ultimately hopeless because it ends in the defeat of death. Life is ultimately hopeless because the best that you can hope for without the gospel is a quick death or maybe a meaningful death even. But Paul tells us a different story. See, he turns our eyes to the resurrection of Jesus and he turns our eyes to the assurance that because Jesus rose, we're going to rise one day too. And when we do, it'll be a resurrection to life. And that life is the end of our story. It'll be a resurrection to a place with perfect justice and perfect mercy, a place that is completely free from sin and free from suffering because of the justice poured out on the cross, because of the mercy shown in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. God's eternal solution is the kingdom of God, the kingdom that began with a crown of thorns and a purple robe and the throne of the cross and that ends and completes in the resurrection to eternal justice and eternal mercy. That is the business of the church. That's what we do, and it is what only we do. Nobody else does it. Because we may work together with people outside the church in God's temporal solutions for justice and mercy, the left-hand kingdom stuff, but the right-hand kingdom stuff, the kingdom of the gospel, the eternal solution, we're the only ones who have it because we're the only ones who have Jesus. And that means we're the only ones who can share him. In other words, the church is the only hope of the world. Our congregation is the hope <clears throat> that the people in our community around us have. And that means you are the hope that the people around you in your life have. Because you and we and the church at large, we are tools in the hands of the one who created the world. Tools in the hands of God for the people around you. So you want to do something to fight the problem of evil? Good. Do it. Fight injustice. That's important. Do mercy. That's important. Because, see, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Those things are important. Be a part of God's temporal solutions. Do that. But do it in the way that only a Christian can do it. Do it because you know of God's justice and God's mercy. The ones that you see on the cross and in the empty tomb and coming on the last day. Do it because you know what the eternal solution is. The only thing that will actually solve the problem. Do it so that when they see what you're doing and they ask why, you can point to the one who is merciful to you. Or as Jesus said it, do it so that when they see your good deeds, they'll glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do it because you know that God isn't just standing in a doorway, looking in at our sin, looking in at our suffering, and wondering what to do. Do it because you know that he's already done it. He did it on Good Friday. He did it on Easter Sunday. He did it at your baptism, and he's doing it right now. 
He's doing it in the Word of God that we carry out into the world, into our community. He's doing it in the words that you speak to your neighbor about the love that the King of Kings has for you and has for them. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds, keeping them steadfast in Christ Jesus. Amen.